Welcome to SVG TV News for Monday, July 18th, 2016. I'm Laferin Fraser with the details. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsal said the decision taken to evict Anne Joshua, proprietor of the Cobblestone Inn, merely is a decision taken from a transparency standpoint. Gonsalves, who called in on WFM's Issue at Hand radio program with Cecil Ryan on Sunday, July 17th, said that Joshua's lease was up and that they had been operating on a month-to-month -month arrangement. Joshua has been operating the business for some 30 years. SVG TV's Nolisha Miller explains more in this report. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, in an attempt to set the record straight on the issue regarding the eviction of Cobblestone Inn owner, and Joshua said on WFM's Issue at Hand Sunday radio program, that Joshua, who had been operating the business for some 30 years, is in fact his first cousin, and while she is an NDP supporter, they have always maintained a good relationship. The Prime Minister said the decision taken by the National Properties Limited was merely to make the leasing of state properties more transparent and to give all interested parties the opportunity to bid for these properties. But first you have to bring this relationship legally to an end and a public tender process will commence and Anne herself can apply to and bid for the property like any other Vincentian. He further noted that Joshua had acquired the lease prior his government's coming to office and when the ULP government took office, they allowed the existing arrangement to continue. He said that following a recent government decision to further develop certain properties, including the Cobblestone Inn, it was deemed prudent in the interest of transparency to put them up for tender. It's amazing that she has chosen to make this thing a political issue. It is, it is sad, frankly. Dr. Gonzalez said the chief executive officer, Holly Duggan, had called Joshua prior to her receipt of the letter to inform her of the NPL's intent to seek tenders and that she was free to place a bid. The Prime Minister added that renovations and expansions were carried out in 2003 to 2004 at the hotel and extra suites were added, after which valuation of the property was carried out, placing the monthly rental at $33,466.75 for 11,629 square feet. The assessment was as follows. The roof bar floor at one seventy-five. $1.75 per square foot of floor space. The first floor, $2.50 per square foot. And the ground floor where the bulk of the renovation was done at $5 per square foot. Giving you, on an average, $2.87 per square foot between the three levels for the floor space of 11,629 square feet, giving you a total of $33,466.75. Remember, I'm talking about before 2005. National properties could have put the building up for tender, which Anne herself could have applied, but they didn't do that. They kept with her. Dr. Gonzalez said the lease agreement was established from March 1, 2005 to February 28, 2010, which the hotelier agreed to. From March 1, 2005 to July 31, 2006, $18,000 per month. And then for the next year, the second year, $19,000. For the third year, 20,000. For the fourth year, 20,000. And for into the 21,000, sorry. And into the fifth year, 21,000. According to Dr. Gonzalez, there has been no lease since then, but rather a month to month arrangement. He divulged that in 2009, Joseph sought and received a reduction in the rent based on the then economic decline. However, in 2011, the rent was increased to $24,150. The Minister of Finance added that while the hotel had constantly requested further reductions on the rent, she had refused to provide requested management accounts and audited statements to support the, her request. Dr. Gonzalez noted the government does not have anyone in mind for the cobblestone property. 
Upon investigation by SVG TV proprietor of Basil's Ban Restaurant, Basil Charles, who is also located in the government-owned Cobblestone Building, stated that he has not been issued any eviction notice. Hence, he is unable to comment on the matter, which he has not been made aware of. He indicated his business continues as usual. Up to news time, Joshua has not commented on the matter. Nolisha Miller, The Evening News. Describing the eviction notice issued to proprietor of the Cobblestone Inn and Joshua as vicious and bad-minded, opposition leader and president of the New Democratic Party, the NDP, Arnim Eustace, claims that the presidents of the ruling Unity Labour Party, the ULP administration, is to cut down those who do not support them. On his New Times radio program this morning, Eustace alleged that under the ULP, persons are continually victimized and this is killing the business and tourism industries. One of the nastiest acts ever committed by a government against its own people. A vicious, and as some people like to say, bad-minded act. On top of incompetence and corruption, you know, showing bad nine and more and more victimization. You're not satisfied with what you did to Bigger Bigs. You're not satisfied with what you did to Marcus De Freitas. You're not satisfied with all those persons, 641 persons in the first five months of your administration, whom you dismissed. Ordinary workers, watchmen, and so forth. You're not satisfied that you want to destroy and Joshua now. What you, why you want to destroy? You heard that she's allowing protesters at the picket line outside the in the crawl office to use the bathroom at Cobblestone. That's why. Eustace said that Dr. Gonsalves' claim about not wanting to be perceived as showing nepotism is a farce, as the building is being taken away because Joshua is known to support the opposition New Democratic Party. You come in now with some nonsense about you don't want people to say, Ralph, have this cousin running the hotel. It's 30 years now, long before your time, she's running the hotel. Nobody can blame you and say you, you put your cousin there now. She's been there for 30 years, under more than one administration. Without the same open and democratic process you're talking about, which you yourself covered for 15 years, half of the time. You see, Anne's problem, Anne's only sin, is that she is seen as, as being not a supporter of the ULP. The opposition leader further accused the ULP of not being transparent as they have appointed persons to positions and have given tender to other organizations who strongly support them without an open process of selection. Did you call for an open and transparent bidding process when you, you all took the car, car parking tongue from the Chamber of Commerce? And give it to Noel Jackson and company. You had open process then? <laughs> what about the millions of dollars you spent to buy lumber and galvanize for whatever program you said you had in place before the elections? Did you have an open and democratic bidding process so that the local farmers could get involved in supplying those materials which you gave away? Did you have an open process that time? In many posts in this country, including the Tourism Authority, did you have an open democratic process? People were appointed to positions. There would be been some advertisement for people like Glen Beach, who are responsible for the same tourism, which is not doing well now. You're going to have an open democratic process to replace him? 
The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will receive approximately $1,900,000 U.S. dollars in Japanese disaster reduction equipment as part of the Economic and Social Development Program to enhance the disaster preparedness measures in SVG. The documents were officially signed earlier today at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs conference room by both governments. In his address at the signing ceremony, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs Sir Louis Straker noted that since the beginning of bilateral ties in 1980, the government and people of Japan have continued to play a significant role in the overall development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He outlined that the disaster reduction project will indeed go a long way, especially in the enhancing of disaster management agencies. Several ministries have been asked to make submission for equipment that can be used to assist with disaster response nationally by the respective ministries and agencies. At this stage, we are receiving the submissions from the ministries and agencies. The submissions will be assessed, then they will be prioritized from the missions, ministries and agencies. The submissions will be assessed, then be transmitted for processing and procurement in Japan. We anticipate that this process will be completed by early August 2016. The National Emergency Management Office, NEMO, under the Ministry of National Security, has been identified as the key government department to coordinate and assist in the operationalization of the funds in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Japan Ambassador to SVG, His Excellency Mutsiku, Mutsuhiko Okada, noted that his government, which shares similar disaster risk challenges, is pleased to share their knowledge and experience in disaster management with SVG. The season is upon us, and the Caribbean is especially vulnerable to natural disasters, such as destructive storms and heavy flooding during this period. Therefore, this grant would be beneficial to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I believe it will considerably enhance the disaster preparedness in your country. The areas of disaster preparedness, along with adaptation to and mitigation against climate change, as well as the area of renewable energy, have been the recent focus of Japanese grant aid assistance in the Caribbean region. In light of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development announced at the UN General Assembly in September 2015, Japan will further extend cooperation in this region towards overcoming these vulnerabilities, utilizing Japanese technologies and expertise acquired, acquired through Japan's similar experiences. Noting that this is not the first time that the government of Japan has contributed to disaster reduction in this country, Director of the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, Howie Prince, outlined that this particular initiative will see the enhancing of all agencies of disaster management. He further urged all ministries and partners involved to take advantage of the opportunity as they seek to reduce this country's risk to natural disasters. Why stand as national um, as a person responsible for disaster risk management in the country director of NEMO, we are extremely happy to be at the receiving end of the equipment that will be provided to line ministries. Remember, NEMO is not the small office that Mr. Howie Prince manages. NEMO is a very large multidisciplinary organization involving many agencies and ministries. What we have therefore set out to do is to invite the ministries themselves to sit with us and say, what would you like from projects like this to strengthen your capacity to work day by day, but certainly to be available to provide us with the services that the country would require in times of disasters. And that's exactly what we will do this time around. 
In more local news, a divided public service, either against itself or against brother unions, cannot achieve optimal development within the region. This was the comment made by Minister of Labor Camilo Gonçalves in his remarks at the opening of the Public Service Association Conference on Saturday. The eight-day conference, dubbed Building Stronger Public Service Unions Through Solidarity and Unification, saw representatives from 17 Caribbean countries, including host St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Speaking at the conference on Saturday, Today, Camilo Gonçalves noted that it was in his government's interest to ensure that public servants are united, strong and committed to their cause since they are the face of the government and are responsible for implementing the people's will. The solidarity of public servants is linked inextricably to the success and advancement and development of our individual countries. A divided public service, either against itself or against its brother unions in other countries, cannot achieve optimal development in any single one of our countries. It is in our interest as a government, as a state, and as a people that the public servants who are the face of the government and who implement every aspect of our national growth and development is united, is strong, and is committed to the work that they have set for themselves. Also addressing attendees was the president of the Caribbean Public Service Association, Elroy Boucher, who stated that solidarity sh should and must be practiced at home if it was expected to exist throughout the region. Boucher encouraged public servants to avoid putting partisan political issues above solidarity with fellow public servants. There, we are there after politicians come and gone. So our allegiance must be to each other. Solidarity must become something that is tangible among us. Otherwise, as the preacher said this morning, you were saying without God, it will fail. That is true. Without solidarity also, it will fail. It is bound to fail. There is no ifs or but about that, it bound to fail. And when it fails, even the simplest of issues that you want to be dealt with becomes an extreme challenge, the simplest of issues. Also speaking at the conference was Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves, who called for a deepening of the regional institutions and mechanisms and encouraged public servants, particularly immigration officers, to act in a manner that accommodated the regional integration, which in his own words, is the very element which undergirds solidarity. Times when you talk, look immediately inside. No, but the rules are there. The rules are there. The rules are there in, the, in Article 46 of the Revised Treaty of Shagaramas. The rules are there in the decisions, the interpretations provided authoritatively by the, the Shanik Myri case. Read it and study it carefully, and you will see. And encourage one another to read and study them and to act in a manner which is accommodated, accommodating regional travel and regional integration because that is part of the movement which undermines, which, which, which undergirds solidarity. The Public Service Union hosted their annual cultural night last Saturday at the cruise ship berth as they marked the beginning of their regional conference. The cultural night, which, which showcased a variety of cultural presentations, was well attended by visiting delegates from all across the Caribbean and Vincentians alike. Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture Cecil Mackey expressed his delight at having the delegates in the country and urged them to return. It is no wonder that persons are attracted to St. Vincent and the Grenadines because we are known for our warmth and our hospitality. And over the next couple of days, that hospitality and that warmth will be showered upon you because we don't want to only welcome you here as delegates to a program like this. 
We want you to return to St. Vincent and the Grenadines on your own. In fact, we are making a very special effort to open our Argyle International Airport very soon. So it will be easier and cheaper for you to come to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Patrons saw performances from some of St. Vincent and the Grenadines' very best as they interpreted Caribbean culture through song, dance, and dramatic monologues. Blue. Blue. And let the strident muscles of your gales shape the arching form of my survival from the long gone glories of the Ashanti chants to the colorful orations of mighty meetings. Some sad news tonight. One family of Vermont is mourning the loss of the newest addition to the household. Two-month-old Elijah Delplesh was found dead, according to the police. The baby's lifeless body was found at around 6 on Saturday morning by his father, 53-year-old Malcolm Polin of Vermont. Reports state that the deceased Delplesh was sleeping with his mother, 25-year-old Ainka Delplesh. The police was contacted upon the discovery of the baby's, baby's motionless body, where he was then transported to the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital. He was pronounced dead shortly after. A post-mortem is yet to be performed. Police say the matter will be investigated with an open mind. Meantime, police are investigating the circumstances surrounding the death of 26-year-old Dexter Rodney, who was shot on October 1st last year. According to reports, Rodney, who was a resident of Murray's Village, was later paralyzed after the shot. The post-mortem indicates the shot, which the shot was what led to his paralysis and is the cause of his demise on the morning of Friday, July 15th. Police said the matter will be investigated in its entirety as someone was already arrested prior to Rodney's death. The death of 49-year-old Frank Kimron Hendrickson is being investigated. According to the police, Hendrickson, a resident of Pettibodel, was dwelling in the area of Camden Park on the night of Friday, July 15th. Police state the deceased was highly intoxicated and was advised to go home after persons saw him sleeping on a bench in the rain. According to reports, he later attempted to enter a small window of an abandoned building where he came to his demise. Allegedly, his neck and body were trapped as the window became loose. Police say due to the circumstances, it appears to be an accident. Darren Barker, Anthony Dopwell, and Mosika Haynes, all employees of the St. Vincent Brewery, were each given a four-month jail term on a joint charge of theft after pleading guilty to unlawfully depriving the brewery of 320 cases of Hyrun products estimated at over $21,000. Before imposing the sentence, the magistrate told the defendant that they were placed in a position of trust and they have betrayed that trust, which is not a good thing to do. Os Osbold Sky Juice Richards, a resident of Victoria Village, was convicted on two separate charges involving indecent and threatening language against the supervisor of elections, Sylvia Findlay. The court heard on the date of the offenses, Richards, along with his common-law wife, went to the electoral office seeking to be transferred from one constituency to another. During the ensuing conversation, Richards used indecent and threatening language to Findlay as he did not appreciate what was said by Findlay to his spouse. Richards was ordered to pay the sum of $1,100 in fines, forthwith or face a four-month jail term.